Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. And aloha. Welcome to another edition of Hawaii in Uniform. I'm your host, Calvin Griffin. And for those of you who may not have seen the program before, here we talk about mainly military and veterans issues, but we also talk about a lot of different issues that are connected. Uh, today I have a very special guest that's coming on the program to discuss uh, the issue that many of us will be hearing about uh, since the elections are coming up. Um, it's one of the topics that's being discussed. Uh, that's the Jones Act. And uh, what I wanted to do was the tie-in. Uh, we talked about national security as part of the, uh, seems to be part of the Jones Act. And I wanted to uh, bring someone on that had, was very knowledgeable about the um, information uh, presenting it. Uh, we're looking for feedback. Um, I believe we have a call-in number if you want to call and uh, provide any feedback. Uh, you're more than welcome to. Uh, but uh, right now, I'd like to introduce to the program Mr. Colin Graybell. Is that correct? Graybell. Well. Okay. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I know it's been a very busy schedule for you. Uh, we've been trying to line this up for, you know, for about a month anyhow. Um, the subject matter, of course, the Jones Act. Um, there are a lot of people that have a lot of misconceptions about it, and a lot of people even aren't even aware that the, the act exists. Could you tell us a little bit about the history and um, what the overall you know, concept of the act is about? Sure. So the Jones Act, um, the law passed in 1920. The formal name of the law is the Merchant Marine Act of 1920. Hmm. It was passed uh, right after World War I with the idea that uh, the United States had a shortfall in shipping when it came time to move our soldiers and equipment over to Europe uh, during the war. Mm -hmm. And to remedy that, they uh, imposed this law which um, requires that for cargo to be moved between two domestic ports, it has to meet four conditions. The ship carrying the cargo has to be U.S. flagged, it has to be U.S. crewed, it has to be U.S. owned, and it has to be built in the United States as well. Mm -hmm. Oh. Um, with all these requirements, it seems like the way things have um, are going, the shipping in the United States, we don't build that many ships. I understand it's cheaper to build them overseas, so that um, will have an impact on making the qualifications for the Jones Act. Uh, is that correct as far as the, um, the shipping industry here in the States? That's absolutely correct. Uh, we've seen a sustained decline in the number of U.S. ships um, over the last at least 30 40 years, mm -hmm. it's been steadily trending downwards. The number of shipyards has declined uh, from the early 1980s uh, till today. I think we've seen something like 300 shipyards close. Um, the number of Jones Act ships, so the number of ships that meet those those, requir those four requirements that I laid out, the number of those ships has declined from, I think, 193 back in 2000 to right around 100 today. Mm -hmm. um, and then the Mariners, the staff these ships, the crew of these ships, uh, we've also seen a decline in the number of mariners. So I think that the Jones Act is not meeting its, its stated goal of bolstering the U.S. maritime uh, capability. In fact, I think we've seen the opposite. Right. Uh, there seems to be opposition about making any changes whatsoever because what happened, uh, just what recently what happened in, um, I believe, in Puerto Rico, um, it was a call for the Jones Act to be um, suspended and there was opposition from some factors uh, factions in the in the government or the unions is that true or yes that's absolutely true and that's usually the case when there's a call for some kind of waiver for the jones act invariably you find opposition from the unions and from the uh the carriers who operate jones act vessels uh they don't like competition I, my, I, my, I can't prove it, but my suspicion is that one of their fears is that once people get a taste of a world without the Jones Act, mm -hmm. when they see cheaper prices, when they see greater availability of shipping, that it'll be harder to return to the status quo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, a lot of people don't know, well, unless you really study the, the subject, especially here in Hawaii, I think it has a major impact on Hawaii, uh, Puerto Rico, uh, Alaska, and I uh, think a few other places anyhow. But why is there such opposition? Because if it's going to benefit the whole, um, you know, the, the populace in, uh, in general, as far as lowering prices, things of that nature, why, I mean, I understand that they're trying to protect jobs and everything else. We don't want to lose American jobs. But um, why is it, you know, so people are so entrenched in, um, 
you know, in opposing anything modifications? Well, here's the thing. I think actually the vast majority of people, if you explain to them what the Jones Act is and what it does, mm-hmm. I think they would understand that um, it's false and this is something that we should get rid of. After all, there is no such thing as a Jones Act, say, for airplanes. You can buy an Airbus airplane built overseas. You can buy a foreign-built car. You can buy rail trucks, whatever. You can do that. But with the Jones Act mandates, you have to buy an American ship. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, once you explain that. But the problem is the average American doesn't know about the Jones Act, doesn't know what it is, doesn't know what it does. And I think they're um, a little bit ignorant uh, with regard to its costs, whereas the people that benefit from the Jones Act, the, the unions, uh, the shipbuilders, these carriers, you know, such as Madsen or Pasha, which operate out in Hawaii, they, they're very attuned to the benefits that they receive from mm-hmm. the Jones Act, which means reduced competition, higher prices than would otherwise be the case. Mm-hmm. They're very invested in this law sticking around. I think it's very interesting, if you think about this logically, you would think that the people most opposed to the Jones Act would be, as you pointed out, the elected representatives from Alaska, from Hawaii, from a lot of the coastal states that are most impacted by shipping costs. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we find that these politicians are the ones that are usually some of the strongest supporters. Well, I think the only way you can really explain that fact is by uh, acknowledging that these states such as Alaska and Hawaii are home to interests that benefit from the Jones Act and that profit from and want to keep it in place. They may be a minority of the population, but they're the ones that care the most about the issue, right. whereas the average American probably isn't that motivated by the Jones Act. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, what I see the impact it has, you know, with the shipping costs and everything else, it more or less, of course, is a monopoly over here. Um, it has an impact on the local economy because if you're able to receive goods and ship them out cheaper, wouldn't that stimulate the local economy? Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think that when it comes to Hawaii, a lot of people are very cognizant of the fact that Hawaii as an island, a series of islands, has to import the vast majority of what they consume. Mm-hmm. And so they think about the Jones Act in terms of increased costs for the goods they buy. And that's true. but. Sometimes I think what's maybe overlooked is it also hurts Hawaii when it comes time for Hawaiian businesses to export the goods they produce. Um, So, for example, we have a situation on the Big Island where you have ranchers that actually put the cattle on airplanes to transport them to the West Coast to feed lots and to slaughterhouses there. Uh, I know that Koloa Rum, based in Kauai, for example, they like to export their product internationally. But because of the Jones Act, you get reduced shipping coming through Honolulu. So what they have to do instead, according to their CEO, is they have to ship the rum from Hawaii to the mainland, and then from the mainland, then on to its final destination, such as Australia. And in fact, it costs them, I think, you know, three times more to ship it from Hawaii to the mainland than it actually does from the mainland to some place as far away as as Australia. Mm -hmm. So Hawaiians get hurt on both ends of this. means that their dollars don't go as far when it comes time to go to the grocery store, for example. Mm -hmm. It also means that they make less money because they have fewer uh, fewer business opportunities and they're less competitive because of this law. Yeah. Yeah, uh, because it seems a little bit strange over here. I mean, people talk about it offline or, you know, the very uh, rarely is any public discussion about this. But here in the state, I mean, we're a water state, basically, and you would think that there would be some sort of... um, Ferry system. Uh, does that does the Jones Act have an impact on what why we may or may not? I mean, why we don't have any um, um, inner island ferries for the most part? Well, uh, last year the Hawaiian government, the Department of Transportation, put out a study looking at the uh, feasibility of of, of putting uh, implementing an inner island ferry system. And they identified the Jones Act as uh, significantly, in their words, raising the cost of acquiring vessels. Mm. And we know that. Um, you know, back in, I think, 2007 or so, you have the uh, Hawaiian Super Ferry. And this was composed of two large catamaran vessels. Uh, these were built in, Mo- in Alabama for $95 million a piece mm. uh, by a company called Ostel. Um, that same company, its parent, is based in Australia. 
uh, that, that shipyard is the only one in the United States capable of building that type of ship, building that double-hulled catamaran ferry. So in the entire United States, you don't have any choice when it comes time to, to buy these ships. And you're dealing with a monopoly, that means higher costs. Um, that parent company based in Australia, they built also a double-hulled catamaran a few years after the one used in Hawaii. It's now being used in Spain. The cost of that was 60 million euros, which is about $70 million, and it seated about 400, I think 500 more people than the Hawaiian Super Ferry. So I think this sums up the Jones Act very nicely. We have, we're we're paying more and we're getting less. You know, in this example, uh, for a ferry that's being used over in Spain, they get it for $30 million less, and it seats more people. Uh, so I have to think that this is it's not exclusively the reason why there isn't an inner island ferry system, but it absolutely, absolutely has to be counted as an obstacle yeah. or an explanation for why Hawaii, a series of islands, doesn't have the ability for passenger ferries. Yeah. Um, the one thing that I hear a lot of uh, our elected officials may say who are for the Jones Act is that national security. They keep throwing that up that, you know, you're, if you uh, uh, are inclined to, you know, support any changes for the Jones Act or eliminate it, you're not patriotic because of the, whatever. But in actuality, during the Gulf War and some of the other uh, events, weren't there uh, a large percentage of the shipping done was by foreign flag? Absolutely. Uh, during the Gulf War, I think the Gulf War is a great example. You know, it's almost 30 years ago, but this is a really useful example because this is a situation where the U.S. military had to get as much of its troops, as much of its equipment uh, and associated cargo over to the battle zone or to Saudi Arabia in this example as quickly as possible. And what happened? We didn't have, we didn't have the sailors. We didn't have the ships. So instead, we had to rely on foreign ships. Foreign ships carried 26% of the unit cargo uh, versus the U.S. commercial fleet carried about 13%. So these are you know, civilian ships. Um, we, in terms of mariners, we were so short of mariners that we had to use uh, two, uh, two sailors were in their 80s. There was a 92-year-old. We had to use teenagers. Um, Desperate. Things were so desperate to get shipping that the U.S. actually went to the Soviet Union and asked them if we could borrow one of their ships. And we asked them twice, and they said no both times. Uh -huh. hmm. Why is, how did we get into the situation? I mean, as some of it seems very obvious, but how, why are we in this situation? Well, what's the root cause of it? Well, um, I mean, the root cause of why we still have to deal with this law, as, as I said before, I think it's because, I think there's a few things going on. There's status quo bias. People are comfortable with the status quo. Change is scary. Uh, we've told ourselves this story that the Jones Act is imperative for national security, and a lot of people don't want to do anything that uh, imperils national security, even though I think when you actually look at the facts and look at the history, you'll see that it doesn't help our national security. I think it actually impedes it. And more than anything, it's it's really uh, the power of the special interests that keep this law in place. Um, and they can't make the argument on economic grounds because there are clear costs there. If there was no cost to the Jones Act, if it didn't benefit these players, they would they would be open to getting rid of the law, but they don't want the competition. So they put out the story about how we need it to uh, for national security reasons, and they wrap themselves in the flag. Mm -hmm. And I think that, unfortunately, most people aren't aware of the facts, aren't aware of the truth, and they don't look any deeper. So we're stuck with this law, unfortunately, for almost 100 years. All right. Okay. Um, Colin, we're going to take a short break, and uh, we'll be back in about, about a minute anyhow. So we'll continue our conversation. But uh, please stay tuned to um, Hawaii in Uniform, and we'll be back shortly. Hi, I'm Bill Sharp, host of Asian Review here on Think Tech Hawaii. Join me every Monday afternoon from 5 to 5.30 Hawaii Standard Time for an insightful discussion of contemporary Asian affairs. There's so much to discuss, and the guests that we have are very, very well informed. Just think, we have the upcoming negotiation between uh, President Trump and Kim Jong-un. The possibility of Xi Jinping, the leader of China, remaining in power forever. We'll see you then. Hey, Stan, the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. And they won't let me do political commentary, so I'm stuck doing energy stuff. But I really like energy stuff, so I'm going to keep on doing it. So join me every Friday on Stan the Energy Man at lunchtime, at noon, on my lunch hour, 
We're going to talk about everything energy, especially if it begins with the word hydrogen. We're going to definitely be talking about it. We'll talk about how we can make Hawaii cleaner, how we can make the world a better place, just basically save the planet. Even Miss America can't even talk about stuff like that anymore. We got it nailed down here. So we'll see you on Friday at noon with Stan the Energy Man. Aloha. Okay, you're back with Hawaii in Uniform, and I'm your host, Calvin Griffin. And again, we're continuing our conversation, Ms. Nicole and Graybow. <laughs> I'm sorry, um, with the Cato Institute. Um, may I call you Colin? Yeah. Okay. I want to be, well, uh, I apologize when we first opened up, when I first opened up the program, anyhow, we did not uh, get a chance to talk about your background. I know that uh, your father was in the military, and if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and also about the uh, Cato Institute and um, you know, what some of the things they're addressing. Sure, so as far as myself, um, I, my father was in the U.S. military. He was a career Army officer. I was actually born in an Air Force base, off at Air Force Base in uh, near Omaha, Nebraska. Um, so I grew up uh, living on and near military bases, you know, all through high school. I left the house. Um, then I currently work at the Cato Institute, a Washington, D.C. think tank that uh, is guided by libertarian principles. You know, this is free, free markets, free people. Uh, try, uh, try to keep the government as small as possible uh, to the minimum. Um, you know, strong believers in individual rights and the ability for people to freely transact, um, which is, you know, why are we here talking about because I think it, uh, it runs afoul of that. It's a violation of, of some of our freedoms. Yeah. One of the things um, that was also impacted, I mean, of course, we're, I want to, of course, we'll talk about what's happening here in Hawaii, but overall, like, say, the Jones Act has an impact as far as the, um, uh, the environment, because right now, are there ships, there's not many ships going from port to port within the United States, is there? That's correct. Um, within the continental United States, the U.S. mainland, you don't find very much coastal shipping at all. Uh -huh. uh, most Jones Act shipping takes place between the mainland in Puerto Rico, the uh -huh. mainland in Hawaii, and the mainland in Alaska. Uh -huh. uh, outside of that, there is very little uh, coastal shipping. Uh -huh. So what, what this means is that I think we're foregoing an opportunity to take cargo off of trucks on our highways and put that uh, on, on ships that go up and down, for example, the, the East Coast or the West Coast, you know, replace some of the, alleviate some of the traffic on I-95 or I-5 in California. Mm -hmm. uh, but we can't do that, I think, in large part because of the Jones Act, which drives up the cost of buying ships and makes them artificially more expensive than would otherwise be the case. Mm -hmm. uh, I think most of the shipping that's done when it's offloaded from overseas, um, since foreign carriers are prohibited, I believe, by law, from going to inner, like going down to Mississippi or things of that nature, is is that the fact? I mean, is there a restriction? Of course, there's restrictions on foreign carriers doing that. And is there an increase in um, like barges or other forms of transportation that um, you know that's being used in the United States? So the one thing the United States actually, well, when defenders of the Jones Act talk about. Uh, why the law is great, they'll say something like, you know, there are 40,000 Jones Act vessels out there, which is evidence of how strong the Jones Act fleet is. Mm -hmm. Well, the overwhelming majority of those 40,000 vessels are, in fact, barges. Uh -huh. uh, they go down, for example, the Mississippi. Um, the United States, when it comes to shipping, barges is one thing that we're actually pretty good at. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of traffic, a lot of competition there on the Mississippi. Uh, we're not as good at building, you know, seagoing ships that can handle coastal waters. Uh, as far as foreign ships being able to go in inland waterways such as the Mississippi, my understanding is that there actually is no prohibition. They can. Uh, the problem is it just doesn't make any sense for them to do that. For example, uh, you know, the, to enter the Mississippi, you'd first have to go through blue water to the port of New Orleans and then from there up the Mississippi, it makes a lot more sense for foreign ships just to dump off their cargo at the port of New Orleans and then from there it'll be placed on barges to go further up the river. Yeah, okay. Um, but getting back to Hawaii, one of the um, beliefs, and I guess it's true, is that when we have foreign cargo coming in from uh, overseas, uh, it goes to California 
and it's offloaded onto the docks, reloaded onto a Jones Act compliant uh, ship and shipped to Hawaii. Is that correct? Um, um, I, I, I can't speak to Hawaiian shipping routes no. and exactly what happens, but my understanding, I, I know that from the perspective of Hawaiian exporters that they have that mm -hmm. consideration that they don't, there isn't as much international shipping coming through. Um, so what they're forced to do, such as in the example of Kaloa Rum there in Kauai, is they have to ship it to the West Coast before they can find a vessel that can take it to its final desti international destination. Mm -hmm. I imagine that the reverse also holds true, um, but I can't speak to that authoritatively. Right. Okay. Uh, what can be, uh, the average citizen, when you become aware of what's going on, what can be done to, I would say, put pressure, but this, for lack of a better word, uh, for some of our elected officials to revisit or, you know, uh, give a really honest evaluation of the, what the act is about, how it's being implemented, and uh, what changes can be, you know, done that benefits all of us. Again, like I said, we're not trying to, you know, nobody wants the union to lose any jobs or anything else, but compared to the overall population, you know, it's, you know, a relatively smaller number, you know. And you would think that there were people who claim to have the interests of the United States and our country in, in, at heart uh, would uh, be more accommodating, you know, to some sort of um, you know, resolution with this, you know, addressing this issue. Yeah, I think, you know, we have to do a few different things. I think we have to, you know, one part of it is educating the average American, making them aware that the Jones Act exists and how it impacts them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the average American, particularly those in Hawaii and Alaska and Puerto Rico, but also I think other Americans, we all pay a little bit, at least a little bit more, in the case of Hawaiians, perhaps significantly more, for the goods that we purchase. But, you know, the costs go beyond that. Like you said, there's an environmental cost. Uh, it means we have more traffic on our highways. We have more pollution. Shipping goods on, on, on uh, ships, it's, it's the most uh, energy, most environmentally friendly um, way of moving cargo. We should try to do more of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we need to educate the average American about the costs. And then I think we have to also educate policymakers. Um, part of that is not only alerting them to the costs, but I think we have to expose the myth of this national security benefit, mm -hmm. because I think uh, lawmakers, understandably, are very reluctant to take any action that is at least perceived as undermining our defense capabilities. And of course, they shouldn't do anything that undermines it. But I think properly understood, the Jones Act does not is not a national security asset. I think, in fact, it undermines our national security, um, both in terms of responding to uh, wartime situations, uh, but also when there's a national emergency such as hurricanes, getting relief supplies as quickly and cheaply as possible to where it's needed. Uh, that's why we have Jones Act waivers. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, a variety of things. We need to educate the public, and we also need to educate our politicians. And, you know, I hate to say it, but uh, a lot of politicians are also swayed by special interests, such as unions. And we also need to make the case there and let them understand that, yes, there will be some people that will lose their jobs, but more people, I believe, will gain jobs. Remember, every dollar spent uh, on moving goods is a dollar that can't be spent in some other area of the economy. So we talk about people that have their jobs because of the Jones Act, but what about all the people that have lost their jobs because people don't have the extra money to spend right. supporting their business mm -hmm. or what they want to do? Um, so the, you know, these are all elements, I think, of a successful strategy. Right. You mentioned the waiver. It seems like when something comes up, a national disaster or whatever, especially like in Puerto Rico and we dodged the bullet over here recently with the two hurricanes that came through here. Is there anything in place currently right now where, you know, instead of waiting for it to happen and the debating whether you're going to get the waiver or not, which caused lives, you know, could potentially cost um, lives. Is there anything in place right now where uh, it, it's being expedited or a contingency plan where it's in place and you just um, make it happen? Uh, unfortunately, no. Uh, like I said before, Jones Act opponents, uh, they hate, uh, you know, giving, they don't want to give an inch on this. They no. don't want to waiver, however temporary. Um, I know that a, a senior official in the Bush administration, I think it was the Council of uh, Bush's, Council of Economic Advisors, I believe, he said that um, 
you talked about the experience with uh, a Jones Act waiver after Hurricane Katrina in 2005 and yeah. how when the topic came up, you know, the phones just started ringing off the hook immediately with people in support of the Jones Act, a very special interest, trying to convince them to keep it in place. Right. Uh, like I said before, I don't think these people want to give an inch. Now, as far as efforts, in the wake of Hurricane Maria that hit Puerto Rico last year, there was not only the 10-day waiver, but there was also uh, a move by Senator John McCain and Senator Mike Lee to pass, to introduce legislation that would grant Puerto Rico a permanent exemption from the Jones Act so they wouldn't have to go through this waiver process every time that there was a natural disaster or some other emergency in which a Jones Act waiver could help the island. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, that hasn't gone anywhere, and I haven't heard any recent talk about uh, pushing that uh, pushing that forward. Yeah, like I say, just boggles my mind. I mean, I understand trying to protect jobs, but when you talk about uh, in you know, putting certain impediments in the way of saving lives, that I cannot wrap my mind around. You know, and I, it's uh, really disheartening to think that there are people out there who are more willing to look at the bottom line as far as dollars than sense of lives. Um, is there anything else that you know is? I, I, we could talk about this for hours. It's been really informative for me. Uh, but is there anything that you think we need to touch on? We're getting onto the wire anyhow, but is there something that you need to be, uh, that would you like to express to the public, our viewers? Sure, you know, I'll just say, uh, you know, a few points. Um, you know, I don't think, we always talk about Jones Act reform uh, or repeal is hurting U.S. shipbuilding industry, and I'm not even sure that's true. Mm -hmm. uh, let's think about other forms of transportation, such as autos or airplanes. Do we think that the U.S. Uh, aerospace industry would be better off if we had a Jones Act law that said you could only buy Boeing planes, for example? Mm -hmm. You can't buy foreign planes? I think absolutely not. Competition has made Boeing better. Right. Uh, back in the 1970s or 60s, when Japanese uh, cars started arriving in the United States, initially that was quite bad for GM, Ford, and the domestic auto producers. But I think in the long run, people would agree it forced them to up their game, become yeah. better, more efficient. We're not doing any favors for the U.S. Right. Uh, shipbuilding industry yeah. or the carriers by maintaining the Jones Act in place. I think that you know ultimately competition makes people better, and they will be better off. Great. Okay, uh, as I mentioned, I wish we had more time to uh, further discuss this, but unfortunately we're limited. Uh, but I want to thank you for coming on the program. I, th I think it's enlightened a lot of our viewers to what's going on because it gives you basically the unvarnished version of what's happening. And I would encourage people to, to um, seek more knowledge anyhow because you got to be very careful with the, uh, where the information is coming from. Um, not trying to call anybody's character into question, but I think that uh, we have to be more vigilant as citizens to uh, what's going on. Uh, I would really like sometime in the future, like say, do a follow-up program because again, there's so much things that's covered uh, that needs to be covered in here. Not only here about Hawaii, but also enlightening other people about what's happening in other parts of the country. Because I think we need to work together as a people, as a country, to resolve some of these things and overcome some of these obstacles. Anyhow, uh, Colin, again, thank you very much for joining us. Um, and uh, any in ten seconds or less, any final words? Please visit our website if you want to learn more at uh, www.cato.org slash Jones Act. Great. Okay. And again, thank you very much for coming on the program. And, of course, I'll be in touch. And uh, I want to thank the viewers for staying tuned. And, of course, we're always looking for responses um, here at the program. So, uh, again, thank you. God bless. And until that time.